give this uh, this presentation. So I'm not going. I'm not going to go into any. I don't know anything about communications. This is the highest technology that that we have here in the FBI. If you can't see, it's a BlackBerry. That's what we use. Um, so just to give you an idea of where we're at. Um, you just figure the federal government, we're probably about 10 to 15 years behind the rest of the world in technology. Um, we always get the good deals when things are going on sale. I think that's how we get our technology. But uh, other than that, uh, what I want to do is, uh, today is I'll come in. I, I, did the, I was the recruiter in San Francisco uh, a couple years back, and, and um, I kind of have a pretty good knowledge of a, kind of a, an overview of the entire FBI. Uh, what the FBI does, um, what the role of the special agent is, what type of requirements the you know the special agent what they're looking for in, in special agents, and uh, of course the training and all that that we get. And uh, but first of all, I kind of want to just talk about myself and and how I ended up in the FBI because um, everyone has a different path that they go through to to get into the FBI. And and I don't know if mine's interesting or not. You might fall asleep. I don't know, but I'm going to tell it anyways. Um, uh, growing up, my father was an FBI agent. He came in in the Hoover days, um, so he always had to wear a white shirt. Obviously, things have changed since then. So um, growing up, uh, because my father was a, an agent, I always wanted to, to grow up. I want to be just like my dad. I want to be a, you know, an FBI agent. He worked organized crime. He worked all these you know, mafioso guys, and uh, he nabbed uh, this guy. I, evidently, he was a hitman for the mafia. His name was Jimmy the Weasel. And uh, he arrested him, but of course, uh, I don't know if he got his nickname before or after he got arrested because as soon as he got arrested, he started uh, ratting out all of his, uh, his mafioso buddies. And so um, I, that kind of helped out. But uh, other than that, uh, like I said, growing up, I always wanted to be in the FBI. And uh, at back then, it was uh, generally they were hiring lawyers, accountants, um, people with foreign language skills. And, uh, and those were kind of your best kind of uh, gateways to get into the FBI. And so going off to college, I decided, oh, I'll, I'll go into accounting. That, that seems easier. I don't have to go to law school. and I don't have to learn a foreign language. I barely speak English. So um, that would be a good option. My first semester in college, I took two accounting courses. The next semester in college, I changed my major to marketing. <laughs> I said, no way, this is too much. Um, but the funny thing is, is uh, while in college and, and uh, taking marketing, I actually really enjoyed it. And um, when I got out of college, I kind of forgot about the FBI for a little bit, and I went into advertising uh, with my marketing degree. And, and in the early 90s, I, I worked at uh, uh, one of the, the kind of premier ad agencies in the world at the time. And uh, one of my clients was the California Fluid Milk Processors Advisory Board. Nobody knows what that is, but what it was is it was the Got Milk uh, ad campaign. A lot of people don't realize that it was just a regional ad campaign for the state of California. But it was so popular that the National Milk Board picked up the advertising and ran it nationally. Um, that was just a, a tiny client, um, but uh, you know, we got big exposure for that. Uh, I was not a creative person. I didn't come up with Got Milk. I was a media person. I just made sure that it reached the target market. And so I'm the one that bought the ad space and did all that stuff. Uh, but uh, the thing with advertising, though, is, is you get hired on to work a client. If that client goes to another agency, you lose your job. It's not like, OK, well, we, we have, we'll put you on this client. Well, there's already people working that client. So every two or three years, I was looking for a new job. And I'm like, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? is look for a job every two years. And I said, no. Um, of course, throughout all that time, my father's, you know, hey, you know, there's always the FBI. There's always the FBI. So um, after my third time of getting laid off because my client went somewhere else, and I, I blame the client services folks for that, um, not, uh, not my position. But, um, <laughs> but uh, so after about the third time, I said, OK, I need some stability in my life. Um, you know, why not apply for the FBI? And at that time, there was a hiring freeze for special agents. So I couldn't get in as a special agent, but they were hiring professional support staff. And uh, so I just applied to get my foot in the door. It's kind of like you apply to become a clerk, but they kind of put you wherever they need you. And so 
I just want to get my foot in the door and I apply for the FBI. And I got in and the first place they sent me was finance. I'm like, great, now I'm working accounting again. Um, so I worked finance for about two years. Um, I was very popular. I was brand new, um, but I was the guy that signed the checks. So everyone had to be nice to me. Uh, a lot of my coworkers, and they weren't uh, you know, treated so well, but uh, luckily, uh, because I signed the checks, everyone had to be nice to me or their stuff go to the bottom of the pile. Um, but don't tell them that I said that. Um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, I worked in, in, in accounting for about two years, and then there was an opportunity uh, to move around. And uh, there was a position, uh, it's, a, it's a surveillance uh, specialist position uh, that came available, and I put in for it and got it. And uh, for the next year, I uh, sat and watched the Russian consulate all day long, every day, watching Russians go in, Russians going out all day long. Um, and uh, it, was, it was entertaining for about a year, but after, I think after a year, it, you know, uh, it, it could drive you a little bit nuts. Uh, so, but, but luckily, at about a year's time doing the surveillance, they lifted the hiring freeze. And uh, during that time that I was in accounting, I had, I had gone through the whole process of testing to become a special agent. Um, so I was already kind of in the queue. I was just waiting for an interview. And um, you know, what the FBI, like the minimum requirements to be a special agent in the FBI is, you need to be a US citizen. You need to be basically between the ages of 24 and 37. Uh, 37 is the age cutoff because there's a mandatory retirement age of 57. And in order to get your federal government retirement, you have to work 20 years. So uh, they kind of cut it off at 37. They do make some exceptions, uh, usually for military folk. Um, but uh, generally, they, they don't make any exceptions beyond that. Um, so, and, you, and the only other requirement is, is you, need, you need a four-year degree. Um, so I, I met all those. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have any of those specific skills that I talked about. I didn't, you know, follow through with my accounting, even though they put me in accounting. Um, but they do hire, they have another section uh, that's called Diversify, which just, it's a pool of everybody else. I just, it's the people that have no skills whatsoever. And I, I was in there. I was one of those people. Um, but, um, so the opportunity came. They lifted the hiring freeze. I was in that process. And, uh, you know, the, I took the test. Um, there was some impossible math on there. It was like, I don't know, I, I, I talked to math teachers who took that test and like, I don't know what that math was, but, um, but I think they got rid of the math section, so that's good for the, the, the next generation. Um, but uh, for me, uh, the next level after testing was the interview. And you go and, you know, you go into a, a room, there's three agents sitting there they're staring you down, and they ask you, I think it's 13 questions, and everybody gets asked the same 13 questions, and somehow, some way, I think because, you know, I have a background in marketing, you know, I can BS or whatever, they believed whatever I told them, and they said, okay, you know, you could be an FBI agent. Um, so, after becoming an FBI agent or getting accepted, uh, there's, you go to Quantico, Virginia for special agent training. Uh, when I went through, it was a 16-week program. Um, now they've increased it since 9-11, they've increased it to 22 to 23 weeks um, because they've added a lot more terrorism into their curriculum. Uh, when I went through, we did about half a day on terrorism and that kind of showed you kind of where terrorism lied in the priorities at that time with the FBI. It was, you know, back then, pre-9-11, you know, a lot of the FBI was, you know, criminal focused. You know, it's just, you know, we're, we, we work criminal agency, we work, you know, you know, criminal matters, and the national security stuff was kind of, you know, they couldn't imagine 9-11 at that point. Um, but they've adjusted the, the training curriculum back there um, to basically address the, you know, terrorism and other national security issues. But um, while you're at Quantico, the type of training we get is uh, obviously a lot of legal. Um, 
got to know that, that constitution backwards and forwards. Um, you know, if, if we're the ones that are investigating civil rights violations, we need to obviously understand the constitution in order to not go out there and obviously violate other people's civil rights, um, like some other federal agencies that won't be named. Uh, <laughs> I, I throw a little humor. I'm a very sarcastic person. I, I apologize if I offend anybody. Um, hopefully I won't. I usually am self-deprecating a lot. So, but, um, you know, so uh, lots of legal, um, obviously firearms, defensive tactics, um, you know, interview and interrogation, and then the gamut of, of various uh, types of investigations that the FBI does. They, they kind of do an overview of everything. And uh, so you kind of get a general idea of what the FBI does before they send you out on the street. Um, I worked in, uh, when I was a support employee, I worked in San Francisco. And uh, what happened was is uh, they lifted the hiring freeze. I went to Quantico and they still had budgetary problems. So generally what they normally do in good times is they will never send you back to where you're from. They will never send you back to your processing office. They will send you somewhere else. But I lucked out that they had no money to send anybody anywhere, so I got to come back to San Francisco and uh, uh, work as a special agent, uh, which was uh, convenient for me because I had just bought a house, you know, maybe about two months before going to Quantico. Um, although, it was in Richmond, and it wasn't a very good neighborhood, but that's all I could afford at the time. Anyways, I'm sorry. I went off on a tangent there. Uh, so uh, while at Quantico, uh, week six, I, and I don't know why they do this or did this for my class, you know, they do this thing where they have this ceremony. It's your, your orders. You get your orders to what office you're going to, and... You know, everyone gets an envelope, and you open it up in front of your class, and you tell them, well, this is where I want to go, and then you open it up and say, oh, I got that. Well, obviously, everyone in my class was going back to the processing office, so that kind of, that party kind of was lame. But anyways, we, there, you know, nothing, no surprises. Let's put it that way. Um, so I got San Francisco, and uh, down the road, uh, I was notified that I was going to white collar crime. I was going to the corporate fraud, securities fraud, bank fraud squad in San Francisco. There, I can't get away from the accounting as much as I wanted to. They throw me back into it. Um, so I, I worked white collar crime in, in San Francisco for roughly seven years. Um, I worked on the uh, Enron task force, so I did some investigations on, on the, uh, the Enron case. Um, I was telling Tim before, uh, before uh, just before the break here, that um, I had a, a case with the, involved the Enron's takeover of Portland General Electric up in Oregon. And uh, it was a cooking the books case where uh, they were basically taking some of the power plants up in Oregon and putting them on their books at Enron and generating fake energy. And obviously, because they're generating fake energy, they're generating fake sales of energy, and therefore, they're generating fake profits that they're, you know, it was just an absolute mess. But they gave it to me, and, uh, you know, we had a, a national task force for Enron, and we were being monitored by headquarters daily. And... Uh, I think what the headquarters did is they gave me this case because they didn't think anything was there. They said, oh, we'll give a dog to Jenkins. He doesn't like accounting. Um, just let, let him do whatever, you know, he can. Well, unfortunately, I found out that, the, you know, Enron was doing some, uh, you know, dirty stuff uh, with the, the takeover of Portland General Electric. And then all of a sudden, headquarters got very interested in my case. So interested that they wanted to take the glory and they stole it from me. So... <laughs> But I was glad because there was a lot of accounting in that case, so don't get me wrong. I, um, <laughs> so I, I worked a, a white collar crime, a various uh, bank frauds, um, security fraud, corporate fraud. Um, I worked a case, um, and I think I could talk about it now. I, I, you know, I, I know I was talking to someone before uh, coming in here, and he said, oh, the last FBI guy is arresting terrorists on planes. He's showing videos, and I'm like, oh, God. 
my, my, my career has been so boring, you know, but uh, I did have a, a sports memorabilia case involving a baseball player, a famous baseball player, and I guess he's infamous more than, than that, uh, by the last, his last name is Bonds, and uh, he kind of came to us, and, uh, you know, he had an issue with uh, the, uh, a friend of his who he had hired to take care of his sports memorabilia. Um, evidently, uh, what was going on was uh, his buddy was entering into contracts and uh, not telling Barry, signing Barry's, uh, you know, name on a bunch of contracts. Like, you know, these sports memorabilia guys will come to, you, you know, the, the, the players and say, hey, you know what, I'll give you $25,000 if you sign, you know, a thousand balls for me or whatever. And so there's all these types of dealings going on. And um, Barry Bonds, uh, the sports memorabilia guy, was entering into these contracts, not telling Barry, signing the contracts, and then signing the balls, too. <laughs> and uh, so, so Barry found out about this, and along with some of the stuff that, uh, you know, he had going on. Uh, a lot of the, his equipment he kept, uh, like all the game-worn stuff, he kept in a warehouse. And uh, he never gave away. He never sold. Um, but what ended up happening is his buddy once again had access to the warehouse. So next thing you know, there's Barry Bonds worn cleats, Barry Bonds uniforms, all sorts of things getting sold in the memorabilia community, and this guy's profiting from that. Um, what ended up happening, uh, uh, I guess the most interesting part of, of the investigation was the fact that um, at one point, the Baseball Hall of Fame had contacted the San Francisco Giants to get something from Barry Bonds to commemorate his, uh, his season where he hit, was it 72 home runs? Was that the, was that the record or something like that? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> the steroid record. Yeah, that's right. Um, so they wanted to, the Baseball Hall of Fame wanted something from, from Barry Bonds to commemorate his, his season, um, his record-breaking season with the asterisk next to it. And uh, they said, well, we don't deal with Mr. Bonds. You need to call this gentleman here. And so they contacted him, and they said, hey, can you give us anything to commemorate Bonds' you know, season? And he said, yeah, I'll get you the uniform he wore. I think it was 73 home runs, but it was... That's the, I'm going to stick to 73. That's my story. That's, a, that's, you know, I'm sure there's fact checkers out there right now. You're just going to prove me wrong. But anyways, um, so this guy said, okay, you know what? I'm going to send you the uniform Barry was wearing when he hit 73. And because the Hall of Fame got it from the source, they didn't do any due diligence on it. And, you know... <laughs> What they generally do, if someone comes and says, hey, this was Babe Ruth's jersey or this was somebody's glove, you know, the Hall of Fame is going to look and say, no, wait a minute, you know, we need to do some investigation. We need to authenticate this. Well, because they thought they were getting it from Barry Bonds, they didn't authenticate it. And so they received a uniform in the mail, and they promptly put it on display at the, at the Hall of Fame. Well, what ended up happening is, and it took about a year but a hardcore Giants fan is visiting the, the Hall of Fame, sees the uniform, and flat out says, that's not the uniform Bonds was wearing when he hit 73. And he went to, like, you know, he went to the, whoever, the, the usher or whoever was working, I don't know, and said, that's not the uniform. And they're like, what? What do you mean? We got it from Bonds. He's like, that uniform is black. Barry Bonds was wearing his home white the last Sunday game of the season when he hit 73. And they're like, okay, we need to go back and look at the film footage. And they went back and looked at the film footage, and of course, Barry Bonds was wearing his white uniform on Sunday when he hit number 73. I think it was 74, isn't it? You did the fact check? Yeah? Okay. All right, good. All right, thanks. <laughs> um, so the Hall of Fame's like, okay, what's going on here? We need to call this guy. They call him up. What's going on? You said this was the uniform he wore. We had somebody come in here, said that, you know, he was wearing a white uniform when he hit it. The memorabilia guy's like, oh, I'm so sorry. This was the uniform. He was the black, it was the black Giants uniform. That was the uniform they were wearing the Friday night game where he hit 71 and 72. And they're like, okay, we'll take, you know, we'll, 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 we'll look into it. 
And so what they did is they went back to the film footage for that game. And yes, they were wearing their black uniform, but just based on the, the positioning of patches and, and various things on the uniform, they were able to verify that it was not the uniform that Barry Bonds wore. And I, I don't know why, you know, he would, I mean, I, it's just beyond me, but what I got out of it was I got a free trip to Cooperstown. <laughs> I didn't ask Cooperstown before I went out there if, you know, our guy, you know, benefited financially from this whatsoever. I needed to ask that question once I was in Cooperstown. I didn't want to ask before because, you know, I, it would ruin my free trip to Cooperstown. I'm, now I'm like, I'm on film, talking about government fraud here. I'm in big trouble. But um, it, was, it, was a, it was an interesting case. What ended up happening with the case is um, we were going to charge the individual. He lawyered up, and he came in with his lawyer, and he basically told us, look, if you charge... My client, my client knows about steroids, money, and women. And we know that you're going to have to put Mr. Bonds on the stand. And we are going to tear him a new one. And we're like, oh, no. We can't put Barry on the stand, you know. And in all this time, you know, dealing with Barry, um, you know, we actually had to ask him. Because all the, uh, the Balco stuff was going on. You know, he'd already testified before the grand jury. Um, and so we, we kind of thought we'd get our little shot in and ask him ourselves, like, hey, do you ever, you ever use steroids? And uh, so we asked him, and, you know, his answer was, I never tested positive. Not yes or no, I never tested positive. So you can draw your own conclusions from that. But um, what ended up happening is, is uh, we ended up deciding that this guy would be a great witness in the Bonds perjury case. And we said, well, we won't charge your client if he cooperates in the Bonds perjury case. And he ended up being uh, one of the star witnesses in the Bonds perjury case. And, uh, you know, poor Mr. Bonds. He's, he is just, uh, whatever you imagine him to be like, that's, that's him. He's an interesting guy, but um, beyond that, um, my last couple of years in San Francisco, uh, I, I moved over to um, what's called the Field Intelligence Group, and, and what it is, is I wanna, I'm going to go into all the various things that the FBI does, but um, basically the Field Intelligence Group is, is more involved in developing sources um, kind of going to, looking through all the criminal and, and national security programs and identifying intelligence gaps where we don't have sources and then sending people out to figure out some way to develop them, get them in, helping us out, and then pass them off to the investigators who, you know, can use them in, in their individual cases. I did that, and then my last year in San Francisco, I was a recruiter, and uh, I had to do my, you know, they, the FBI gives you one transfer in your career to a, a place where you want to go. And of course, you know, most of us don't get that option. We usually get that one transfer to the place where our wife wants to go. So um, I was born and raised in the, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. I never wanted to leave. My wife was from Sacramento. Um, she wanted to go back to Sacramento. Um, so I... My wife got her one transfer to Sacramento, and that was about seven years ago. And um, I contacted the Sacramento office once I got my orders for transfer, and I talked to one of the big wigs, and they said, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I worked white collar crime. Uh, that's what I'm comfortable with. I'd love to continue to work it. And they're like, well, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. And about one week before I showed up in Sacramento, they said, you're working international terrorism. I'm like, great. But, um, you know, the, the, and, and when I first got there, I, was, I got into a huge deep depression. I was, like, I was like, I can't, I don't understand this. Now I'm dealing with classified documents. I have to put secret on this. I don't know how to, you know, it was, it, it was a little difficult. But 
after a while, I, I started, you know, finding the things that I liked about it and, and kind of grasping onto that. And uh, as you can tell, I like to talk and I like to ramble on. So um, I, I like to go out and talk to people in the community. And it was a great opportunity, um, especially dealing with, uh, you know, folks in, in, the, in the Muslim community because I knew nothing about Islam. But um, to be able to go out there and, and, and people are so willing to, to, to teach you and talk to you and, and educate you on, you know, various, you know, uh, you know their, their, their faith and whatnot, it, was, it, it worked out great. You know, I sit down and have a cup of tea with somebody for three hours and, uh, you know, and at some point, you know, they, they may be working for me, you know, and helping me out. And uh, no one wants to go on source meets with me because I spend hours with them and it drives them nuts. And everyone that comes in nowadays wants, you know, that instant gratification. And, and I, I like to just sit down and talk to people. And uh, so I really enjoy the kind of the, the source development uh, aspect of working terrorism. And uh, so I've been working that for the last seven years. And at some point, somebody came up with the idea of making me the coordinator of the task force, the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And uh, in addition to doing investigations and developing sources and handling sources, I also run the task force, which means I do a lot of uh, liaison with other federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies and uh, trying to recruit them into the task force and getting them involved. And uh, so I spend a lot of time doing liaison work. But enough about me. That's 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 my career. Um, I, I I guess at, at one point, you know, and I'm sure everyone, a lot of people in this room probably have gotten to this point, where, you know, you've worked long enough, and then finally your boss is somebody who has less time in, than you and less experience. And um, I, I I experienced that a couple years ago, and. Um, the FBI does background investigations for any of the, uh, the White House appointments. And my supervisor, you know, actually assigned me a background investigation. And as soon as I got it, I'm like, no, we, we give this to the new agents. The new agents do background investigations. So I went into her and I said, look, you know, you, don't, you, don't, you can't give this to me. You've got to get it to the one of the new guys. And she's like, Okay, I won't give you any more. Just do this one for me, please. I'm like, okay. Um, it was uh, it involved, I think it was the chief information officer of the state of California uh, was getting an appointment to the White House. And she put down in her, you know, her little background that her direct boss was Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I'm like, well, I need to verify her employment. And I need to talk to her boss. Um, <laughs> And the governor's office has always given us a phone, a phone number to call, you know, whenever we need to talk to the governor. Um, I don't think anybody answers it. There's no answering machine. It just rings and rings and rings. Um, so I knew about that. But fortunately, as the coordinator of the Joint Terrorism Task Force, um, we had a CHP officer on our task force who had just left and was working now on the governor's protection detail. So I called him up and I said, hey, I've got this very important background I need to take care of, you know. They wouldn't assign it to the new guys because this is important. <laughs> I need to get in and talk to the governor. I need to verify the chief information officer of the state of California's employment. I need to talk to her supervisor. And he's like, well, let me see what I can do. You know, a couple hours go by and all of a sudden my, I get the call. Okay, Governor Schwarzenegger really likes the CIO. And he wants to put in a good word for her, so he'll talk to you. <laughs> I'm like, OK, all right. So um, one of the other highlights, and, and like I said, you know, th this is just, I, I went in and, and I met with uh, Governor Schwarzenegger um, in his conference room. He had his Conan the Barbarian sword right there on display. Um, another good thing that, that uh, you know, my buddy from the CHP who was on his detail told me was is that the governor had just recently gotten back from Iraq. And um, if anybody's familiar with you know, the military, you know, every unit, every group has a challenge coin. And so what he discovered was when he went out to Iraq, everyone was throwing challenge coins to him. And so when he got back, he's like, I, 
you know, I can't ever go back again without being able to trade with them. So he created his own Arnold Schwarzenegger Governor of California Challenge coin. And, and so my buddy in the CHP told me about it. He's like, oh, he, he's totally into these things. He's collecting them. So I ran around the office. I found everybody. I'm like, SWAT, you guys got a challenge coin? The evidence response team, give me your challenge coin. Get, you know, accounting group, give me your challenge coin. You know? And so I went in there with like a boatload of challenge coins from the FBI in Sacramento. And uh, I plopped them down on the table. And he's, oh, this is great. This is great. And he told his assistant, go get a challenge coin, go get a challenge coin. And the guy came back with one. He's like, what are you doing? You just gave me like 20. You need to give me, you need to give him 20. You know, like, so, um, you know, then I had to, of course, ask Arnold Schwarzenegger if he knew if the chief information officer of, you know, California did drugs, if he had any personal knowledge of her doing drugs or, having an alcohol problem or anything like that, uh, just like we would do on a regular background investigation. Um, but uh, that was my brush with the governor. Evidently now, it's like anybody in the world can walk into the state capitol and ask to talk to Governor Brown, and if he's around, he'll talk to him. So uh, I guess he's got a lot of time on his hands. Um, <laughs> is this being filmed? Oh, no, no, no. I don't like that. But, uh, Anyways, let, let me get back to the FBI. Enough, like, I don't want to talk about me. You guys have heard enough about me. Um, the FBI is, is kind of broken up into uh, various uh, departments. Um, one is the national security um, branch. And national security covers uh, international terrorism, domestic terrorism, and counterintelligence. Um, does anybody here know what the CIA does. What, what is their specific goal? What is the goal of the CIA? Anybody? Nothing? That's, that, that, that's what we get back from them when we ask them for help, but um, the CIA is basically out there all over the world collecting information. You know, we want to know what Iran's, you know, nuclear capabilities are. That's the CIA's job, is to find out to spy on the rest of the world, find out what, what's going on, who's got what, who's doing what, you know, assassination here or there, maybe, I don't know, that's classified. Um, but, you know, that's generally what they do. Well, people don't think about it, but the rest of the world sends spies to the United States to find out what we're up to. And, and so it's the FBI's job to identify these spies and get them out of here or find some way to neutralize them. And so our counterintelligence division is the group that does that. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, people think of all the major threats out there, and, and there's obviously some obvious threats, and there's some not so obvious threats, too. Um, but that's classified. I can't talk about it, but that's my CI presentation. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, other than that, uh, we have uh, domestic terrorism under our national security branch. And domestic terrorism, is, is kind of, uh, it's kind of difficult for those folks because it's not really, most of the stuff they work is criminal in nature, it's not intelligence in nature. Uh, they'll work, you know, uh, you know uh, some of the stuff like, uh, like Oklahoma City, um, the, the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. Um, and, and this is where kind of like the civil rights stuff, it gets really kind of, you know, there's a gray area in there. Um, I'm sure many people know that, that the guys involved in, in the bombing of, of Oklahoma City Federal Building had ties to the Michigan militia. Well, militias are not illegal. And, you know, they, we can't investigate militias. But militias tend to attract individuals, like-minded individuals, that tend to may go beyond or go rogue further from what, you know, the mission of, of, of militias are. And um, so, you know, they're working, uh, our domestic terrorist folks are, are working, you know, guys that go beyond and, and uh, you know, the anti-government folks um, who, who seem to think that, uh, you know, the government is imposing too much upon them, like taxes and various other things. But health care, there you go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, 
so you have kind of the, that's kind of your your right wing individuals um, in regards to domestic terrorism. We have uh, uh, individuals called sovereign citizens also, and the, the sovereigns um, they have used violence, um, but a lot of time they use white collar crime too. They don't they don't believe in in you know uh, you know the banks charging interest. They look at the United States government as a corporation. And they feel as though, you know, because it's a corporation, they don't have, you know, they, the, the, the government can't impose things upon the people, like taxes or, you know, interest or anything like that. So um, there's a lot of white collar crime involved in, in, in sovereign citizens. A lot of them will contact people and say, you know what, I can eliminate your mortgage. You just sign your house over to me, and we'll just get rid of it. I'll start filing paperwork, you know, down at the, the county recorder's office, and, you know, it'll be gone. And yeah, it'll be gone because you just signed it over to them. That's why. But anyways, uh, th there, was a, there has been some incidences of violence uh, involving sovereign citizens, um, generally towards police. Um, there was an incident in West Memphis, or Arkansas, um, where... Two police officers pulled over a van, um, and uh, initially, what the sovereigns like to do is they have all this paperwork telling them, you know, this is this is our rights. You you don't have any right to pull us over. You know, we don't recognize you as any type of authority whatsoever. Weird thing is, is they recognize the county sheriff as an authority, um, but but nobody else, because uh, the county sheriff is an elected official. So the people of the county elected him. So therefore. You know, he's okay, but, you know, who elected California, California Highway Patrol? You know, so they, they, they look at that a little differently and uh, ended up killing uh, two police officers in, in, in West Memphis um, just based on just getting pulled over for, I don't know, it was a busted tail light or something. They weren't even speeding, but um, so they are dangerous individuals. Um, kind of on the left side of domestic terrorism, you have your animal rights, liberation, um, you know, you've got your Earth uh, Liberation Front, and uh, San Francisco tends to, the Bay Area has been kind of ground zero for, for those type of movements, and, uh, you know, that, that continues. Uh, we actually, there was just a, uh, I think an Animal Liberation Front uh, person who was involved in multiple arsons, um, over many, many years that, that was just uh, uh, sentenced up in uh, Oregon. And then we had some stuff down here. Um, if people remember um, not too long ago, uh, it was an Animal Liberation Front group that uh, uh, torched all the big rigs down at the Harris Ranch and caused millions and millions of dollars of damage to, uh, to that business. Um, in addition to uh, kind of your groups, uh, the, our, our domestic terrorism folks also work, uh, kind of your white supremacist groups um, also. Um, the final branch or final division under national security is international terrorism. Um, and basically that's, there's a list you can go on the internet. I think, it, actually I think Treasury is the one that puts it out. but. They identify all the different known terrorist organizations or identified, you know, as the United States recognizes these groups as terrorist organizations. Therefore, if anyone provides any financial support to them, um, then they are, uh, you know, helping to support terrorism. Uh, so your Al-Qaeda's, your Hezbollah's, Hamas, um, all these groups um, are international terrorism related. And uh, that's what I work. Um, all those cl cases are classified. I can't talk too much about those either. So I'll move on to the criminal matters, which is the meat and potatoes of the FBI prior to 9-11, and I think is becoming the meat and potatoes again, because, uh, you know, uh, it'll always be there. It's, uh, I think a lot of people are more interested in the criminal stuff. So uh, in, in criminal, we work violent crimes, we work the gangs, we work drugs. Um, interstate transport of stolen property, that's pretty violent. Um, you know, we also work uh, any of the crimes on, uh, you know, government land or Indian land. In the state of California, though, uh, the Indian reservations have an option. They can, uh, you know, uh, 
they can either choose to be regulated or, or enforce, have their laws enforced by the state or the, the federal government. Um, so it, it varies. There's not a lot of Indian territory in, in, in California where, where the FBI gets involved. But um, in, in various other areas of the country, that's 100% of what offices are working. Um, so it, it, it varies. But um, in addition to that, um, we work white collar crime. I kind of talked about securities fraud, corporate fraud, bank fraud. Um, they work health care issues, health care fraud, um, fraud against the government. Whenever there's a huge um, kind of natural disaster in the United States, um, there's a lot of government fraud. Um, I remember, uh, you know, uh, like recently in, in Oklahoma with the, with the tornadoes, what was that, about two years ago? Um, you know, there's a lot of assistance that, that goes into, federal assistance that goes to the victims of, of these natural disasters. And um, what we find is whenever this goes on and there's a natural disaster and the, the federal government is offering assistance to the victims of, of these disasters, you know, individuals in Connecticut and Maine and Alaska and, you know, everywhere are putting in, oh, I, I, I live in Oklahoma. You got to send me some money. So um, it's unfortunate, but, but that happens a lot. And uh, so we, we look into that stuff. Uh, we also work public corruption. Um, so, you know, any of the, the lobbyists, any of the politicians um, that are kind of doing underhanded deals, um, you know, we'll, we'll look into. It's very sensitive. Um, obviously, uh, they're, they're very difficult to prosecute, and uh, that's why you don't see a lot of it, um, because they are so sensitive, because whether they're innocent or not, if, you know, the word gets out that they're being investigated for some type of corruption, that could be enough to affect their, their political careers. Um, and um, I could tell you that a lot of times, you know, information gets sent to us from kind of some rival factions that would say that they're, you know, hey, you know, my opposite party counterpart is involved in this or that, and you know, trying to defame them. And so uh, kind of weeding through that is, is very difficult. And uh, also, you know, the U.S. Attorney's Office, it's, it's you know, it, they want everything handed to them on a silver platter. And so uh, generally they want something on tape and they want, like, you know, them to, to lay everything out. I, I had a similar, it wasn't a public corruption case, I had a bank bribery case when I worked white collar crime and it was kind of a similar thing where we had a company who basically monopolized, it was a spinoff of an antitrust case, uh, who had monopolized uh, all the cash access machines in casinos throughout the United States. Any casino you went into the United States, these guys own the ATMs or the cash access machines. And how they were able to monopolize that was through bribing bank officials, bribing casino officials, and um, so I got this, this case where, uh, you know, a vice president at a, at a, a major, major bank, um, I, I won't name the bank, but it's in America, um, was uh, basically approached by this group. Um, they needed to have uh, some type of backing from, from the banks to, to help process uh, the transactions for their cash access machines. And uh, they made a contract with this vice president of this bank. And um, in the process of doing that, they made several promises like, hey, we'll buy you this Mercedes. Hey, you know what? Marble would look really good in the entranceway of your house. Um, hey, why don't you take these, uh, these debit cards? There, there, there might be a couple tens of thousands of dollars on there. Just enjoy. Um, and, and that's what ended up happening, and this individual, after he gave him the contract, quit the bank and went to go work for these guys. So uh, the contract had an expiration date, though. So two years later, there was another VP, VP out there with the bank. We knew it was going to get approached, so we approached the VP first and said, hey, are you willing to work with us? We think these guys are bribing um, you know, officials, and we think they're going to try to make the moves on you. And that person said, absolutely. 
So we wired our person up, sent them in with these guys. They had multiple meetings, and they finally got to the point where these guys wanted the contract. And uh, obviously, we can't tell our person to say, hey, I want this, because that's entrapment. So the bad guys have to be the ones to bring it up, and the bad guys have to be the ones to lay everything out. And unfortunately, you know, we're listening in to this, this meeting, and it ended, and nothing happened. And as they're walking the VP out the door, uh, one of the bad guys said, hey, why don't you come in this room for a minute? I want to talk to you. And he pulls her into a room, shuts the doors, no one else in this room. Then he starts whispering, you give me this contract, I'll take care of you. And we had already coached, you know, our, our VP on, on how to, you know, you know, if this happens, what to do. So it's kind of like, well, how can you take care of me? What do you mean? Don't worry about it. We'll take care of you. Well, what do you mean you'll take care of me? Don't worry about it. We'll take care of you. And it went on and on and on, and the guy would not lay it out for us. And it was to the point where it's like, okay, does the FBI get involved in granting a contract between these two? And you know, obviously the the bank doesn't want to to get involved with these individuals again. And uh, we appreciate their cooperation, but it, it, and I, I imagine that working public corruption is exactly the same way. Is that they're going to want the corrupt individual? to be the one that says, we'll take care of you because we'll get you a Mercedes, we'll get you a new house, we'll, you know, a trip to Hawaii, you know, whatever you saw on Price is Right, we'll get it for you, plus we'll get you a job afterwards. And, and so uh, th that's why those, those cases are so tricky, um, public corruption. We also work color of law issues, uh, police corruption. Um, my father actually uh, got a, had a, a great case um, in, in, with uh, involving the San Francisco police. There was a uh, organized crime individual who was uh, well known in the community and um, needed some security. So he approached some San Francisco PD guys um, to to provide security for him. And uh, SFPD felt it was a little too sensitive for them for their internal folks to investigate. So they approached the FBI and asked them to. And uh, there were incidents where, you know, individuals were seriously injured and hurt just because they were at the wrong place at the wrong time when some deal was going on and the security force decided to, uh, you know, get them out of the way. And uh, so uh, there were several uh, guys that um, the FBI had took and talked to and took care of <laughs> that's a PD but those are the types of things um, that that the FBI work obviously the civil rights um, stuff uh, falls under uh, our white-collar crime programs too and uh, we just recently uh, had uh, well I guess it was probably about two years ago also um, where we had uh, two uh, Sikh uh, gentlemen in Elk Grove California who were uh, were uh, shot at um, and uh, we, we've been working that case, uh, you know, uh, very uh, hard because it's in, you know, in the community. Um, a lot of times, uh, the Sikh community is kind of misunderstood too. People look at them; they are wearing turbans. They think they're Muslim, and you know, uh, they may be targeted just for the fact that they're wearing turbans, and that they, people think that they're Muslim, but they're not. Um, so uh, we're trying to work with the Sikh community down there and, uh, and uh, get a re end result. And I think they have some pretty good leads uh, on that case. So uh, hopefully we can wrap that up soon. Uh, the FBI also works cyber crimes. Um, and uh, cyber crimes would involve uh, hackings. Uh, generally, it, it's going to be at kind of the corporate level. There's going to have to be some massive financial loss in order for the FBI to get involved in any of the hacking, um, but if there's any hacking into the infrastructure, um, you know, of the state or, you know, the United States, um, then we're definitely involved, uh, you know, whether people are trying to hack into, you know, government websites or websites uh, that, um, you know, involve some type of protection of the, the, the national infrastructure, 
uh, the FBI is uh, working that. We also, uh, on the cyber side, jointly with international terrorism, target uh, cyber jihadis. Um, so a lot of individuals go online and, uh, you know, provide in, uh, tools and information to, to others who are seeking knowledge in, in how to build bombs um, or even in just in, in hacking and creating havoc in, in U.S. government or, you know, U.S. industry, um, you know, websites that cause some type of financial loss, uh, you know, to our economy. So, uh, you know, we, we do the cyber stuff. Uh, a lot of cyber folks have to, have to work the child pornography, too. Um, that's a big one, um, unfortunately. And uh, then our other section, our final section, is our intelligence section, which I kind of talked about. Uh, and what they do is a large majority of our intelligence section are actually analysts. They're not agents. And uh, they look at every program that we work and they try to find out what we're missing. Where, where do we not have coverage? Or what are we not working? What are we not addressing? And bringing that up to us and, and saying, hey, look, you know, uh, you know, we have a certain community here. Um, you know, we have a large, I don't know, uh, Somali population here. And there's a lot of the, their kids that are traveling back to Somalia you know, they may be getting involved in, in fighting with Al-Qaeda back there. And, you know, we're not addressing that because we're too busy looking, you know, at, at, at other individuals. And uh, so they'll bring that up and they'll, they'll, they'll go and, and brief, you know, everybody. And, and on top of that, they'll identify people out in the community who might be good sources. And uh, there's agents that work in the intelligence side that go out and meet with these people and try to develop them and, uh, you know, hopefully get them to, to assist us. Um, other than that, uh, there, there's a couple of other specialized jobs that, that special agents have. Obviously, we have surveillance groups, um, and uh, so they're, they're constantly out there on the streets, in the air, underground, wherever. They, I don't know. I, 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 they're out in cars. I was sitting in, when I did surveillance, I sat in a room and looked at TVs all day. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't soap operas. It was, which I prefer, but it was the Russian consulate. But um, these other guys are, are following the baddies around, making sure that, you know, they're not doing bad things. And if they are, then documenting it and, you know, if, if whatever, having to intervene at some point. But we also have technically trained agents. Now, these are the guys that we go to when we need to install cameras somewhere or um, we need audio surveillance. Um, you know, when we come up with an idea, like say for my bribery case, if, uh, you know, it, you know, giving my, my VP a, a, you know, a wire, and maybe that was, um, it's too bulky, it's too large, you know, someone will notice it, you know, you can come up with something, you know, hey, I would like, you know, I want a blazer. I want the camera and the button type thing. And, and these are the guys that will help and, and go out there and develop that. Um, we go to our tech guys. You know, they tell us whether they can. They go to headquarters, and headquarters will, you know, that, that's where, like, the technology lies, not, not in our telephones, not in our Vietnam-era radios that we have in our cars. But, um, yes. We have, there's, there's tech guys that are, that are uh, assigned to each division. They work in the division, and, uh, you know, most of what they're doing is they're, they're doing the, the camera installs, um, you know, closed-circuit TV. Um, they'll be, uh, well, we used to be able to install trackers on cars. Um, evidently, that's changed, and we haven't been doing that for a while because um, evidently it's, uh, that is more invasive you know, knowing where somebody's car is parked in their garage than, you know, getting their phone records or financial records. But, um, you know, so uh, these guys are the kind of the ones that, that, that do all the electronics type, electronic surveillance type stuff and provide us with our equipment and teach us how to use it. Because, like I said, I just learned how to use the BlackBerry and I've had it for five years. I still don't know how to forward it, it to my, my desk phone, but, you know, I... I I'll get. Is your 
you leave a message, I'll get back to you. What's that? Is your BlackBerry encrypted so that your conversations and the inter-agency and intra-agency communications are not liable to be kicked off? Anybody in this room can basically decode a cell phone. All right. Well, we'll test that out. Well, you can... I'll, I'll call my doctor, see if you guys can uh, find out what's ailing me right now. But uh, <laughs> yes, they, they, they do have an encryption. Um, but I, I think that only goes to, you know, lessen the communication, really. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's just difficult. It's, it's best to just meet in person. I, I don't like to talk on the phone anyways. Obviously, I like to ramble on and on in front of groups of people for hours on end. So, uh, you know, so we have the, the tech agents, and then we have, um, we have obviously our SWAT, um, our SWAT teams, and each division has a SWAT team. I can tell you there's 14,000 special agents across the United States, actually across the world. We have people all over the world um, in, in various embassies. Um, but uh, most of the agents are here in the United States, protecting the United States. It's about 14,000. There's 56 uh, field offices. And um, each office has its own SWAT team. Each office has their own technically trained agents. Um, it's when we get to the point where developing kind of you think of it, we'll make it type stuff. That's where um, we have a group back at Quantico, Virginia. We have a s facility back at Quantico, Virginia, where those guys put it together. Um, so, you know, uh, we had um, just recently, we had kind of a case, a national security case on some guys, but there was also, they had some involvement in a white collar case. And we wanted to find out what was in their house. And so the white collar guys went to go interview them at their house. And what we did is, uh, I think we put together, he uses glasses. They put a camera in his glasses somehow, in the frame of his glasses. And um, we used that and got a good idea of the layout of the house and, and stuff like that. So if further down the road, and that's always good for just, you know, if, if at some point you need to go and arrest somebody to know, you know, the layout of a house and, and obviously, you know, for, for security issues. But um, so they were able to kind of develop that and, and, and work with us uh, in that instance. Um, and then, uh, like I said, uh, we have our, our bomb techs. Uh, our two bomb techs in Sacramento are very busy right now. There's a house up in Redding. I don't know if you've seen it on the news that's packed full of explosives. And they're still trying to figure out what they're going to do with it. They've had to evacuate an 1,800-foot uh, radius around that house because of the, the danger um, of the, the amount and the amount of explosives in that house. And uh, unfortunately, when you get into incidents like this and you're trying to figure out how to dispose of these, these, uh, these uh, explosives, a lot of times they want to burn, just want to burn the house down. And evidently, that won't blow. I would think, you know, when you put fire to it, it's going to blow up, right? But I don't know. I don't understand that stuff. But evidently, they want to set it on fire. But um, evidently, the environmental groups are getting involved now, saying that there's lots of chemicals in there, blah, 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 blah. We can't do that. And so they're going back and forth. Meanwhile, everyone in that neighborhood that got moved has to wait for the governments to work it out. And the, the you know, environmental watchdogs and everybody to come up with a solution that will be happy for everybody. But um, in addition, uh, we also have uh, people that are trained in weapons of mass destruction um, that can, uh, you know, deploy to, uh, you know, various incidences of, of uh, stuff like that happening. And that includes, that doesn't include like, you know, some, you know, chemical weapon going off. It's, it could be a train that derails that's carrying, you know, toxics, you know, substances or whatever. Um, they'll, they'll obviously respond to stuff like that too. And, uh, you know, for on a federal level and, and, and obviously provide support and, and assessment for that. Um, so that's kind of what the FBI does. Um, the FBI is, um, you know, they've, I, I told you at the beginning, when, when, when I applied, they just wanted lawyers and accountants and, and language. People have spoke foreign languages. Um, well, we've kind of evolved since then, and we've added a lot more 
kind of uh, you know trades and and what, what we're looking now and we still hire accountants and lawyers and you know you know foreign language speakers but uh, we also are looking people with science backgrounds physical science backgrounds um, engineering uh, we found that you know people in science and engineering you know through their education and their work experience um, are very detail oriented those are very detail oriented professions and that translates well into you know being an investigator um, obviously with you know computers and uh, you know becoming a lot more popular um, in the last uh, 20 years uh, we're looking for people with with computer backgrounds uh, computer science and uh, you know, engineering also in computers uh, to, to help us with our, our cyber investigations. And, uh, and we still hire folks with military and, and, and people with law enforcement backgrounds. And then there's those diversified people, like, you know, your marketing folks that had people who couldn't pass accounting, so they switched their, their stuff. But that's me. Um, I'd be happy to, to, to answer any questions. Please don't get technical with me. I just, I, my, I have a Blackberry. Be nice. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, the question was, uh, when does the FBI kind of determine um, I guess venue when it comes to some type of crime um, and and specifically between like federal and like state or local and generally what will happen is um, there has to be a federal crime for one um, a lot of people think you know you watch some of these television shows and oh god now I can't remember it's it's been canceled so nobody cares anymore but without a trace and you people watch this without a trace and it's the FBI and they got some really cool offices and everything's glass and they, they got the best computers and you know when I got in the bureau we had 486s and not everyone had their own computer so I would come in I'd be always the first guy in but I'd turn my computer on and it I couldn't access it for 20 minutes it needed to warm up so I'd run and get coffee by the time I got back the guy I shared the computer with would be on the computer and it's like ah oh, you're killing me, but um, like let's say take kidnapping for an instance. Um, FBI will not investigate kidnappings. Um, kidnappings. Well, uh, let me caveat that. Um, the FBI doesn't investigate kidnappings right off the bat. That will go to the locals. Um, at, at some point, uh, you know, some local departments just don't have um, you know the resources to to investigate kidnapping and they will ask the FBI for assistance um, or if, if there's you know uh, you know incident where they believe that the individual uh, that was kidnapped was taken across state lines and that's where you get your federal nexus for kidnapping is taking someone across state lines then the FBI will get involved but even in those cases we will still allow the local department to be the lead on those investigations. Um, like we had the, uh, oh God, I, I, now my, her, her name is, is uh, it was, it was the, the little girl in Tracy who disappeared out of the trailer park and then uh, you know, they thought she was kidnapped. Uh, I can't remember her name, but um, you know, obviously, at some point, uh, you know, Tracy PD asked the FBI to get involved in her disappearance, and uh, and, and we did and assisted. And um, you know, in an instance like that, um, you know, we're always going to allow you know the locals to be the lead. We're just there to assist them. Um, you know, if it's something that has a federal nexus, um, then the FBI will 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 take the lead. Or, you know, depending on what the, the federal nexus is, it depends on whatever federal agency. Um, any type of bombings um, that, that happen, occur, the FBI gets first dibs on it. The ATF doesn't like that, but um, the FBI gets first dibs on, on any bombings. And uh, anything beyond that, you know, will determine whether it was terrorism related or what. And if it is, then we're going to work it. If it's not, you know, we'll, we'll defer to, to the ATF. And that's kind of how we work. Um, 
What's it? Oh, gangs. Um, a lot of times with the like the violent crime stuff, uh, we work in task forces. So uh, we put together like safe streets task force where we work with the locals, um, you know, and the state and the county folks. And our end goal is to get the best prosecution possible. You know, we'll 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 look at the federal courts, we'll look at the, the local, you know, the state courts, and whatever's going to get the, uh, the, the, the biggest, uh, you know, punch, uh, you know, put these guys away for the longest time, that's the venue that we're going to use. Um, but uh, a lot of the, the, the gangs, the drugs, um, you know, even, even health care fraud, more, uh, like, you know, mortgage, a lot of mortgage stuff, we have a mortgage fraud task force out in Sacramento um, where we, we work with the uh, California Department of Justice. And, uh, you know, I think the banks throw a lot of money to help support our task forces there because, um, the, you know, they're losing money, but not really because they're federally insured. That's one thing that I worked when I worked bank, bank fraud. It, it scared me. I was like, the banks don't care. Here's the money. Go. Hey, we're insured. Hey, see you later. Come back, you know, but... Um, but yeah, so uh, at the task force level, really all they're doing is what's going to get these guys the most time? Where can we prosecute them? And so we work in a task force environment when it comes to stuff like that. Yes, sir. The FCC. Okay. Um, that's an interesting question. No. Um, you know, I, 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 to be honest, I couldn't tell you. I, I you know, I... I know that, um, and I'm not even sure if the FCC would be involved in video pirating. Um, <laughs> sure. Sure. But of course, we've sold all the weapons to the to the cartel, anyways, right? Is that is that is that what happened? No, no. Sure. Yeah, I'm. You know, I I am not familiar with it. Um, you know. Okay, all right, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, be nice, be nice. They're getting restless out there. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. unfortunately, I, I've never worked in a, on, in a border, uh, international border uh, division, so I, I, to be honest, I, I have no clue. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, that's a good question because, um, you know, historically, you know, your criminal investigations are, you know, kind of your, you know, a, a crime has been committed and you investigate it. Um, I think where we're being proactive is on our national security side where, um, you know, we're trying to identify individuals out there that pose a threat. And then in doing that, if we can determine that they are truly have a, you know, pose a threat to the United States, we somehow have to get our way into that individual. Um, you know, we have cases, and you'll find like so many times um, when we take down individuals for, say, like, you know, terrorism, uh, many, many times we're already in with that person. You know, it, it's, it, the person has the desire to do something but they may not have the means to do it. And um, what generally happens is, is we use undercover agents and other people that, to, and informants to get to these individuals and you know, kind of introduce them. And our undercover agents may be explosive experts you know, and be the ones that are able to 
enable these individuals to, to carry out whatever they want to. And, uh, and, and that's another thing I talked about, like the bribery cases, you know, your, your terrorism cases are kind of the same way, where generally, so many times we've had, um, you know, cases, and not, not in Sacramento, but, you know, other more, you know, target, you know, rich environments like New York or wherever, where you have an individual and um, we get an undercover into them and they, you know, the individual, the bad guy, you know, has a desire to blow something up and wants to blow something up. And um, what we generally do is we introduce them to our undercover who can provide the boom for them. And uh, that's what we do. We provide them the bomb. And then generally, they'll, the, the, you know, the bad guy will go out, drive their car to some populated area, and uh, you know, walk out and use a cell phone or whatever to detonate it, and it doesn't go off. And you know, they'll call up the undercover and say, it didn't go off. We'll do it again. Press the button. Ah, it didn't go off. We'll do it again. Try it again. You know, and, and so what ends up happening is, obviously the bomb we provided wasn't going to go off to begin with, but that's the level of commitment that the U.S. Attorney's Office wants to see in these individuals before they want to you know, prosecute them. They want them basically on the stand saying, you parked your car in this populated area, you thought you had a bomb that was going to go off, how many times did you press that button, you know? And, and the, so there's no question whatsoever that that individual was, you know, attempting to do that. Because so often, I mean, there, we have so many cases where there, there's somebody that keeps talking big, but they don't do anything. So um, uh, it's, we're a lot more proactive on the national security side than the criminal side. And that's just the nature of it. Um, I, I could tell you bank robberies, if the banks were willing to spend the money they could prevent bank robberies from ever happening. But why? You know, because they're insured, exactly. So there's no reason to spend the money to prevent bank robberies. But, you know, that's just, that's just the nature of the beast. Yeah.